Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 190th video cast, 180th podcast for the week ending June 8th, 2023. Excited to be here. Want to share a couple photos from a little over a week ago from Memorial Day. This was us in town at the Memorial Day parade. Uh, girls are getting pretty big. Uh, that's a little Annabelle and Mimi uh, and Caitlin, of course. And then this was the girls with the uh, military uh, with the flags and thank you for your service by the way and the girls uh, watching right along and clapping them on uh, so that was a lot of fun uh, quick on the media want to thank Farah Elbarari Elbarawi for including me in her article on Bloomberg this was actually a couple weeks ago I never got the alert but uh, thank you for including me in this article uh, and that was right before the big tech run uh, when we were talking. Uh, and then I want to thank Samritha Arun Salam and Svea Herbst Bylis for including me in their article on GameStop last night. Um, so you can read that if you're interested in that subject. And our quote of the week uh, is from Seth Klarman, legendary value investor. And he says, typically, we make money when we buy things. We count the profits later but we know we've captured them when we buy the bargain. And that's what we're doing here. And we're going to talk about a number of those this week. Uh, but first, I want to put a quick clip of the CraneShare CEO. They own and run the $5 billion KWeb ETF run by Brendan Ahern. And he makes a lot of the points that we've been making about China and some of the things coming down the pike for the second half with stimulus and his expectations of them substantially beating so let's take a listen here. Jonathan Crane, uh, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Thanks where, for having Where me. does that leave us? Um, something of a disappointing recovery push out of, uh, out of China in terms of the real economy. The market has suffered, but then you have others saying it just looks cheap now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think the uh, export numbers that came out, I think part of that also has to do with, you know, global, you know, situation. And, uh, and demand out there. So it's not, uh, it's not just about the, the China opening up story. Um, I just actually was, um, I just visited China two weeks ago for the first time uh, in three years. Um, and uh, it was amazed to see how everything has come back strong. Um, there's, you know, the, the, uh, uh, everyone's back to work, uh, a lot of traffic jams, um, restaurants are full. And, um, you know, the, the story of China coming back and opening up is real. I think some of the uh, initial numbers uh, might have been aggressive, okay? And that's why everyone's saying, is, is this really, um, you know, is the opening up story as strong as we anticipated? I think what's going to, I think everyone's going to be positively surprised second half numbers. Um, it takes time to open up a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the question, too, though, is it comes along with this more long term idea that, you know, there, there's just kind of a separation underway in terms of disintegration of the economies, uh, you know, us reshoring, things like that. Essentially, this idea that it just seems like less accommodating for our capital over there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, a lot of the uh, focus is geopolitics right now. And I think um, the, the opening up story at the beginning of this year was very strong. OK, we 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 saw a lot of flows into into crane shares. And then you had a geopolitical event, uh, the balloon. Yeah, sure. And um, and I think since then, a lot of focus, the overhang on, on the China markets from a global perspective has been geopolitical. OK, I think that has to get solved. I know um, uh, Secretary of State Blinken is going to be making a trip in a few weeks, which is a, a definitely positive movement. Um, and so diplomacy is going to have to, um, you know, take over now. There needs to be a stable, good communication relationship. Uh, but trade keeps increasing between U.S. and China. I mean, I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're codependent on each other. OK, larger first and second largest economy. Um, a lot of the S&P 500 companies, their growth is China and, and that continues. Um, so, you know, there, you know, China's China's here to stay. It's a. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we, we see a lot of opportunity. But it, it's not going to get solved, right? There might be a little bit of a thaw and a little bit of easing tensions, some sort of diplomacy. Great. But the overall direction we're moving in is not good. And I wonder, as an investment manager, if you, if you worry about 
regulations or restrictions on Americans being able to invest in Chinese companies and what that would do for your ETFs. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, that that, you know, is a issue day. I don't think that will ever happen. OK, um, you know, I think um, the from the China perspective, they want to participate in, in U.S. capital markets. Um, I think that the PCOB issue with that people have talked about where with the audits, um, that's going to get solved and they're already in, in process uh, the first round. Um, so I, I think that can be, go into a, a, a positive direction. But I, I think, um, you know, I think stability around the relationship and communication, at least there's communication is 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 a start in the right path. Yeah. And of course, we've been talking about all the CEOs uh, from our country that have been there's been a pilgrimage trips as well. Yes. 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 Um, the latest. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and you have a lot from the a lot of CEOs from the financial industry are are going over there. I mean, China is the fastest growing asset management, wealth management market in the world today, and uh, and global banks need to be there. What do the so. flows look like now? Um, the, the flows for uh, ETFs. ETFs um, you know, the, we've had some outflows this year. Okay, we had uh, we actually had a, a lot of inflows at the beginning of the year. And um, and then there was uh, some geopolitics. So we see these markets in China oversold. Um, it's incredible entry point right now uh, to come into, you know, funds like K-Web. Um, you know, it, it's the the the, cons the consumer is is back in China. Um, you know, you look at um, the, the government yesterday uh, or, or lowering uh, uh, deposit rates to, sure. to trigger uh, more spending. You're going to see stimulus. Um, there's a lot of dry powder in, in, with the Chinese government right now. So um, they're well positioned with a lot of tools right now um, to, to you know, expand their market. Yeah, it's a familiar playbook. See if, yep. uh, see if it runs again. John, good to see you. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having me. Thanks, Thank John. you very much. And we're back. So uh, in that context, a um, couple uh, Chinese headlines here. First and foremost, uh, the Chinese and the U.S. held candid talks after they had that security spat. So the key is consistent dialogue is starting to happen. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to see here in just a second um, after the balloon, the CIA made a secret trip over. Now Blinken is going to go over. You've got J.P. Morgan that went over this week. The, uh, the uh, head of Citibank went over this week. Uh, so the list goes on and on. Um, next, uh, we had the PBOC cut deposit rates this week, uh, which is going to lead to the reserve requirement ratio cuts in the second half, which will be another boon for stimulus. And uh, despite the PMIs coming in strong, exports uh, and imports were a little bit weak. But that says more about the rest of the world than it does about China. Uh, this was from Jack Denton. China stocks rise again amid PMIs and stimulus hopes. So uh, we did see those cuts. We're going to see the reserve requirement cuts moving forward. And he talks about how that bodes well for BABA, which is the Pur Purchasing Managers Index, hitting 57.1 uh, versus estimates of 55.2. This is the 618 shopping festival, which started showing that uh, uh, sales were up in terms of Chanel, up 70% year over year. Dior jumped 50% on the Alibaba platform. So a lot of this stuff is starting to play out. Confidence is starting to rebuild. Keep in mind, it's only been about four and a half, five months since the opening. The patient is just getting out and about and now starting to go into a mild trot. Soon he'll be jogging after the heart attack and before long they'll be running marathons and sprints. Uh, Alibaba's cloud latest generative AI takes the administration out of business meetings. This would be the equi equivalent of like the US Slack, what they're referring to, their messaging, uh, which is pretty valuable. Here's a note, Morgan Stanley expects 6% economic growth in the first half of 2023, uh, which is pretty above estimates. Usually it was back half loaded, but they're still holding uh, and the momentum to continue through Q4 2024, which is pretty exciting considering they were most negative, now they're the most positive. Uh, China stocks too cheap to ignore for JP Morgan Asset Management and Invesco. Invesco fund favors tech names including Alibaba and Tencent. Uh, it's, and uh, here's the other guy, Ibrahim says, quote, it's probably good to be a bit overweight on China here. So the opinion starting to follow trend once the price continues to move. And what are the catalysts we covered in recent weeks? Number one, 
was the debt ceiling to get the bid out of the dollar. The dollar stopped going up. And then number two is going to be the uh, Fed pause, or they're going to call it a skip, and then it'll turn into a pause when the data confirms it. Uh, but uh, the most important thing happening in the next seven days is going to be the inflation numbers on Tuesday, and we expect to see a three-handle on that. And I think that's going to completely change sentiment around uh, uh, inflation and expectations moving forward, mo mainly because people kind of in, have in the back of their minds the inflation target should be 3% versus 2%. So uh, moving right along. So as that inflation data comes in off the high base effects on an owner's equivalent rent, which is 30 to 40% of CPI, um, uh, off the high base last, these will be May numbers and they'll really kick in in June and July, but May reported in June. Um, those numbers will come down. That'll cause the skip. And then the dollar will start to price that in. Uh, and that will be very bullish for emerging markets for Alibaba, uh, et cetera. Now, also the... Uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and Sun Hung Ki, among 21 firms approved by uh, HCAC's Hong Kong Exchange for Yuan share trading counters starting on June 19th. So this is basically going to bring in more buyers uh, for Alibaba stock because they'll be able to buy in Yuan and not have to convert to get Hong Kong dollars. And this is a very positive thing uh, moving forward. So you've got those two things happening. Um, the other thing that we noted here was this, uh, uh, podcast about why the world quit, can't quit its addiction to Chinese goods. And I referenced this a week or two ago, uh, talking to a, a former high level executive at Newell Brands. And he said, there is no other China. India doesn't have the infrastructure. Vietnam's too slow and sloppy. And, uh, and this, uh, podcast goes into detail why, uh, De-risking is one thing at the margins, but decoupling is not possible. China's stimulus could focus on its dire property sector. That's that's the playbook that's worked every single time in the past. Here's what economists expect, and they go through uh, what they're looking for, but we know it's coming. Uh, China's securities regulator touts long-term value investing to soothe investors. So he's saying buy these things while they're on sale. They're also going to do... Um, encourage the sales of stock focused funds so mutual funds they're going to start to push those out to the public probably retirement type accounts as well as tax breaks and favorable accounting rules as incentives to get people back into the market uh, this was jane frazier uh, as we said i don't know why this got signed out but all right uh, lose your bias against chinese stocks as the tide could turn with policy support in store that comes from J.P. Morgan private banks, so not just their asset management side, but their private bank side. Reasonable value, valuation, steady earnings growth, and policy support will reward investors taking risk on Chinese equities after the recent sell-off. Um, now, Bank says more than two-thirds of its U.S. clients have no exposure to China, and around half of them are materially underweight Europe. And this is key. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about how we were one of the lone bulls. There were a couple others uh, out there in in the doldrums in October when uh, the S&P was at 3,600 and 3,700. Uh, you had Tom Lee. You had Ryan Dietrich. You had um, uh, Seth Golden. Uh, but that was basically it. And you had uh, some hosts that were open-minded like Charles Payne on Fox Business. Uh, but everyone else was committed to the... It's going 20% lower after you were already in the hole. And uh, some of the people that run the largest hedge funds in the world were saying that and getting people out of their stocks at the exact wrong time. Uh, so that's Jamie Dimon coming back from China. Chinese stocks in U.S. rally on sign, sign that policy support uh, may come. Beijing is mulling housing market stimulus. So more there. Uh CICC predicts uh, China annual GDP growth near 6%. Real estate investment growth may turn positive. So they're looking at that stimulus coming out of the pike, which will be a good thing. That's worked every single time. Top performing fund favors China stocks as bearish tide grows. Chinese firms offer pretty good value in some areas. This is the Invesco guy. Fund likes big China tech stocks such as Alibaba and Tencent. Amen, brother. 
Uh, Baba's Kainau global stocking volume spikes 4x year on year for the 618 shopping craze. So these numbers are going through the roof. Th those are booked for Q2, by the way. So that's a good thing here as we've got a few weeks left in Q2 and the numbers are showing up from the 618 uh, retail festival. Chinese services activity picks up in May on improved demand. So that's good to see. That was the PMI uh, rose to 57.1. Of, um, uh, well above expectations. So there are signs, uh, green shoots, so to speak. And even B Bank of America's Michael Hartnett, who tends to be a contrarian, says, buy the Hang Sang and sell AI. So he's saying that, you know, NVIDIA has gotten a little overdone and, uh, and it's time to buy uh, some value uh, abroad, namely uh, Hang Sang. And when you talk about Hang Sang and the weights, you're talking Alibaba and Tencent. Uh, which is the name of the game, we, we agree. And then the Merck CEO was out this week saying China decoupling is unfeasible, would ha carry huge costs. So these powers that be of the multinationals and the largest companies in the world are going to put political pressure, you know, get someone on a plane over there to talk. And sure enough, guess who's uh, heading on a plane is Blinken in the coming weeks and things are going to get smoothed over so at least everyone can make money. And if they want to say that they hate each other on TV, they can do that. But uh, people are going to make money and uh, keep jobs and grow, grow the respective economies. Uh, Biotech's buying bonanza. Why the FTC's Amgen battle won't ch uh, chill the spree. So uh, this game is going to continue on. We're, we're going to talk about deals and drugs and, and what's been happening in that sector. But this guy got it right. Josh Nathan Kazis over at Barron's. The headline of his article was many biotechs have net assets that top their market values. We're going to go into this in detail in the article of the week. Uh, one of our holdings here, we were joined by a, uh, a healthy partner in third point. Dan Loeb took a, took a large Amazon stake. So we'd like to see that. And then a uh, new CEO said, oh, by the way, he has a Baba stake as well. Uh, says employees can't work remotely after all. Uh, this is Farmers Group, one of the largest insurers. Uh, he's saying, yeah, we were just kidding about that work from home. Get your butts back to the office. We're going to see more and more of that, and it's starting to be reflected uh, in our uh, Class A best properties in the best city in the world, REIT uh, in Vornado, which uh, you couldn't give it away, and now it's starting to get, get bid, which is pretty exciting to see. Uh, 3M and DuPont started soaring last Friday on uh, rumors of a settlement. 3M was supposed to go to court on Monday. The judge gave them three weeks to work out a settlement. That would be huge. The rumors are it'll be about $10 billion, which is well below what the expectations were. I think analysts had the combined value of the PFAS and the earplugs at like $30 billion dollars. Uh, if they do 10 on this, they can probably get the earplugs done for four and call it a day. And uh, and then the stock can just start to rip roar. So uh, it'll take some time to work through, but hopefully we get this locked in in the next few weeks and then we move on. It's interesting about this stock. They've been paying a dividend for 100 years. Uh, they've been a dividend aristocrat, which means it increases the dividend every single year uh, for the last 63 years, I believe it's been. Uh, and our base case has always been, even if the worst case came to pass, $30 billion, they pay it out over 10 years, they're paying $3 billion a year in dividends right now. So uh, even if they had to pay that out temporarily to settle this uh, lawsuit, they would still compound the business in the way that they've been compounding it at high double digits to low 20s per year. Uh, the difference would be, do I, do I get a dividend every year or don't I get a dividend? And for me, that doesn't matter. That's not why I'm in the stock. So uh, the worst case in our view is accounted for, but it looks like we're going to have uh, less than the worst case, uh, which means huge upside. And we're pretty excited about that. Uh, buy Ford stock because Americans look ready to buy more cars. We're going to talk about this in the article of the week. He put some very ambitious numbers on the U.S. expectations for this year. Um, he's talking about... Uh, you know, 19 million, million cars a year in the U.S. Expectations for this year, just to put that in perspective, are 15.1. So that could be a huge boon for CPS because they live or die on the basis of industry volumes. Um, uh, here's the, uh, here was the uh, Blinken thing going to vi visit uh, China. This is from Jacob Sonenshine over at Barron's. Great guy. 
had me in one of his articles a couple weeks ago uh, and I've uh, spent some time with him. He's a, he's a really smart guy, up and comer for sure uh, on uh, Fox Business pretty pretty regularly now. And um, he his headline for this, this week, it's going to be, I think, the cover of Barron's, don't fear the bull market, why stocks are headed higher. And you'll see some of the same arguments that we've been making. Uh, and he really ties it all together exceptionally well. Um, uh, so so that, that's useful. Uh, next, hedge funds lose $18 billion betting against the tech stock rally. So uh, world's smallest violin, but it just goes to show you how poorly positioned they were and why positioning matters and why we frequently take the other side when they're at such extremes. Uh, I think um, Icon, that, that's excluding the $9 billion that Icon lost in the last six months, shorting the general market. Uh, Google to crack down on office attendants, ask remote workers to reconsider. Um, all that has to happen. We saw initial jobless claims spike today. Uh, unemployment rate went up to 3.7. You get up to 3.9, they're no longer going to be asking, they're going to be telling. And, uh, and that's just the progress that we anticipated, and that's, the, that's what's playing out. Even Martha Stewart, when she's not modeling for the swimsuit issue at age 83 or whatever she is nowadays, kudos to her. I hope to be modeling for swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated when I'm 83 as well. She says, should America, uh, she's opposed to remote work and says, should America go down the drain? And she makes a reference to France. She said, I think in the article, uh, or in the interview, like, what are we, France? We take a month off for August. It, it, you know, it's no wonder that uh, they don't have the prosperity we have. So she's saying, let's look. The party's over. Let's get like, let's get back to it. And um, and I think that's uh, more and more uh, bosses are thinking in that way, and that'll be good for a class specialized, selective commercial real estate, uh, the most hated sector of all time besides China. Uh, okay, uh, indicator of the day, S&P stocks above the 200 day moving average. So what I like here is, you know, there's this been this view that it's the Magnificent Seven, it's just seven stocks driving the whole rally. And that's kind of been true. But that's starting to broaden out in the last few weeks, uh, particularly the last week and a half after we wrote that article about the sea change. And we're going to talk about that. But you can see it here. There's a lot more room to go. And I think this next bit of the rally is going to be uh, less about the top seven that have started the rally and more about the bottom 93% that have been um, uh, kind of left behind that are now going to play catch up. And all these managers that are underweight, when they go to play catch up, they're not going to buy up. They're going to buy what hasn't worked yet and, uh, and, with, and they're going to buy with leverage and they're probably going to be able to catch if they do it right. Um, Okay, next. The one that got away stock market and sentiment results. Here's our article of the week. And as I said, it was very lonely being a bull last fall when the S&P was in the 3600s to 3700s. A few smart hosts kept an open mind at those subdued levels when we were pounding the table to buy equities. Uh, see the circle dates below. So I'm going to go through some interviews from October 4th and October 17th. Uh, first one was with Will Kolaris. He kept an open mind. Uh, probably thought I was a little too optimistic. Chloe Aiello on October 17th kept an open mind on Cheddar. So uh, Will was over at CNBC. Uh, Chloe was at Cheddar. Then uh, even in December when the S&P turned back down, it was at 3,700 and change. Uh, the claim and countdown over at Fox Business had me on and we made the bull case, as did Charles Payne. Uh, when we were still, I believe, in the 3800s recently, uh, and uh, you know, Charles Charles hung in there though. He was he was generally optimistic throughout the whole thing, and uh, created a forum for the the few bulls that were were around to to talk. So that was really valuable. And then I went through just like a few weeks ago. We went through all those negative comments I got on the day we called the bottom in 2020. Uh, well, I spent some time this week going through all the TikToks from October and November and all the comments on my channel, uh, official at official hedge fund tips over on TikTok. And you could just see hundreds of negative comments. The Great Depression is coming. This has just begun, blah, blah, blah. And I just replied to a lot of these people, you know, like, hey, um, be willing to keep an open mind, be willing to be burdened by the data 
and this is a lesson. Everyone pays their tuition when they're getting started or when they're new or inexperienced. Uh, when everyone's crowded on one side of the boat, you've got to separate the data from the noise. And that's what we tried to do. And we were criticized for it, but it's played out as anticipated. And the same will be true with the Chinese stocks. The same will be true with emerging markets. Uh, you know, Cooper Standard's already playing out. The same is starting to happen with uh, biotech. And sometimes they happen overnight and sometimes they take a little bit longer. But, you know, going back to the quote of the week, uh, which George posted, which it, it's uh, it's key. We already know that we've made the money. We make the money when we buy things. We count the profits later, but we know we've captured them when we buy the bargain. And uh, that you know that that's the most important thing about it. So, um, all right, moving along. Back to the article here. Okay. So for many, this 23% rally off the lows has been, in the words of country singer Jake Owen from his 2017 hit, quote, the one that got away. So he's talking about uh, this girl that was uh, moved by him during summer break. And, you know, long story short, she moved away and he missed it. So uh, a lot of that happened from October till now. So we've taken you on a look through the rearview mirror. Now let's have a look through the windshield. Uh, the good news is there's plenty of runway ahead. So yes, uh, the negative people missed a lot, but there is a tremendous amount to do because uh, the bulk of the rally of late has been driven by a handful of stocks, but the bulk of the rally prospectively is going to be driven by the 93% that haven't yet participated. Uh, so the, the, the good news is there's plenty of runway. The bad news is it's going to be a bit more tricky. But we're going to kind of guide you through what we're doing and uh, you can do your own work and, and uh, see what makes sense for you, uh, for those of you who are not clients. So for starters, uh, I don't like the, the look of the SKU index right now. So this is ordinarily a level I would look to begin buying downside protection. It's spiked up to 158.3. It's now dropped back to 146.7. And you can see, you know, this is usually where uh, they're buying insurance two, two, three standard deviations out. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think this time is different and why uh, I'm being more open minded. So first and foremost, for those of you who are new, a simple explanation of how SKU differs from VIX. The SKU index is calculated using S&P 500 options that measure tail risk or returns two or more standard deviations from the mean in the S&P 500 returns over the next 30 days. The primary difference between the VIX and the SKU is that the VIX is based on implied vol volatility around uh, the at the money strike price. So VIX is at the money while the SKU considers the implied volatility of the out of the money strikes. So that's a key thing. While I wouldn't be surprised by some short-term market consolidation now that people are starting to get a little excited, I also wouldn't be playing for it because I still think the pain trade is up based on positioning. Um, um, the, the primary reason I'm making this exception is because what the tail risk event traders were betting on was uh, it was a U.S. debt default. So the debt ceiling negotiation failure. It did not happen. So all of their insurance premium went up in flames. And... Um, so that's what I think is unique about this situation. And I become way more concerned when SKU spikes on no news and a background of euphoria because the implication is that the smart money is quietly getting prepared for wholesale distribution. So an example of this would be last year when the SKU spiked in October, November, I'm sorry, 2021, right before the 2022 peak. Everyone was euphoric and yet the skew was spiking in the background. That would be an environment that would scare me a lot more, similar to 2018, uh, but, but not the current environment. We're not at euphoria yet, and I do think that a lot of this was tied to a US debt default and them not coming to a conclusion uh, and, and the way the media had worked it up ahead of time. So there's something to be said for that. Um, in this case, they were preparing for a nuclear bomb that has since been disabled and SKU is now dropping. So if you take a look at this recent chart discussing the election cycle seasonality we referenced in the cheddar appearance with Chloe above, 
you will see there is meaningful runway ahead. And this is the election cycle. We're really just getting off the mat. And this is the time, the period in the election cycle, the second and early third year where you get the most returns in the shortest amount of time. So I do think the pain trade could be up and we could press a lot higher than people think. Uh, if you zoom out a bit further, you can see the secular bull market timeline that we referenced in 2020. You can go back through our our articles by just uh, scrolling up here on categories, click on commentary. Every article we've ever, ever written is there. You can just uh, Google them by, or scroll down by date. And our core thesis, largely based on demography of the millennial age, uh, has been that this, this, this move has got another 10 or so years in it, and we're kind of halfway through this secular bull that broke out in 2013. Um, and this gentleman, uh, Robert Slu Slumer from RBC, and thanks to my buddy over there who passed it along, um, is of the same camp. And he kind of extrapolated what that could mean in terms of the S&P as we look out to the 20, early 2030s. And he's got a number of 13,500 to 14,000, which, um, which would be in line with what happens the second half of secular bulls. And the type of gains that you get towards the end of the rally. So I think there's a lot more to do here. We're obviously selective in how we do it. So if we're wrong about the market, we're still buying businesses with a large enough margin of safety that we can make money. But uh, when you get everything working in concert, buying great quality compounders when they're temporarily impaired, plus you get the tailwind of being halfway through a secular bull, uh, it's the best of both worlds. And then you, you tack a little bit of pre, you know, premium on there and, and you juice it up. So it's going to be an exciting time for sure. Um, now, here's where part of my optimism comes from moving forward. This is the uh, non-commercial futures positioning on the S&P 500 minis. This is basically hedge funds and large traders. And uh, managers are the most short S&P futures since the last debt showdown in 2011. So this is where they are now. Last time they were this bad was 2011. Uh, that was a monster time to buy. Other instances of extreme shorts crowded to one side of the boat that were great buy opportunities besides 2011 were 2020 and 2015-2016. Uh, the bear camp will point to the one exception in 2007 as a reason to be bearish. But I would take issue with that due to the fact that cash levels were still euphoric in 2007, meaning managers were still aggressively in the market and in equities versus today where they're still in excess cash, even following a 23% rally off the lows since October. So you can see the cash levels here. They were at almost all time lows. They were basically euphoric. Uh, the only other time they were ever lower was uh, 2004. And uh, here we are basically at higher cash levels still than the great financial crisis lows in, in late 2008, early 2009, the uh, euro debt uh, and uh, debt default lows in 2011 and uh, uh, late 2011 and also in 2012, and then the 2015 and 16 drawdown as well as the pandemic lows. So we're at crisis level cash levels. In 2007, they were at top top level cash levels, which is, means um, they were fully invested. So today's cash levels more closely resemble the 2011, 2015, 16 levels that coincided with aggressive future shorting versus 2007 when managers were still fully invested in equities. The continued cash and worry imply, even if we get some short term chop here in June, which would be normal seasonally, uh, that the path of least resistance and the pain trade based on current continued defensive positioning is up. Now, earlier, I referenced the next move higher will be trickier. What did I mean by that? Well, last week, we made a bold claim that we are now on the cusp of a sea change and that a new group of stocks would start to outperform on a relative basis to the Magnificent Seven tech names that have driven the rally thus far. So the Magnificent Seven are Meta, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Tesla, Nvidia, etc., and the remaining 400. So the remaining 493 companies are up 0% year to date relative to the S&P, up 11%, and and those are up, you know, big. So uh, also you can see their growing influence. They're now the top eight stocks are 31% of 
the S&P's total value. So that's going to revert to the mean. It doesn't mean they're going to crash. It just means they're going to perform less well as the market goes up. And the 93 that haven't performed are going to perform much better than they have. So, uh, and by the way, it's interesting. I look at some of the stocks that are flying um, and I'm seeing, um, I didn't quite piece it together, but a, a common denominator is they are, have high dividend yields. So you basically just got ahead of the debt ceiling. You had peak yields in the, you know, treasuries, uh, certainly uh, zero to two year. And so there was no reason to be in dividend stocks. So people were selling that because they could get the same 5% yield they were getting in these dividend yielders in U.S. Treasuries, but now that the debt ceiling's done and now we're going to get the skip or pause next week, uh, provided the inflation numbers come in as we expect, yields are going to compress and uh, the demand for those stocks with high dividends is going to go up. And that's where you're going to see the uh, the 3Ms, the VFCs, the uh, VNOs, even though VNO has uh, uh, deferred their dividend payment till the end of the year, they still have to pay it before the end of the year. Um, uh, all these all these big dividend stocks that have been taken out to the woodshed, it's not uh, Stanley Black & Decker. It's not because they're businesses are that impaired it's because of the supply and demand for the yield and they couldn't compete just like the banks couldn't compete on deposit rates with the u.s treasury neither could these companies that people were in for the dividends uh reach okay uh now they're going to become more in favor once the treasury stops competing with uh these dividend growers so i think that's a very very key change but Okay, so here were the meaningful changes we talked about last week as a result of the Fed being done. Number one, the dollar will resume its downtrend after a, quote, debt ceiling safe haven bid in recent weeks. So it started down in October last year. It's bounced in the last few weeks on the debt ceiling. It's starting to come in a little bit since then. Obviously, after next week is the key catalyst. The most directly impacted asset classes from this development will be the groups that have been left behind in the recent rally. We said emerging markets in China will resume. The uptrend they began in October, China trades inversely with the U.S. dollar, and it's the heaviest weight in emerging market indices. Uh, so it was in this box. It's since rallied. I think it's up to 87 today or something like that. So it's rallied about 8% 8 since this note. 7%. Uh, no, close. No, it would be 9%. 9 times 8 is 72. So about 9% in four sessions, which is pretty good. Uh, biotech will continue to ex will accelerate its slow recovery from May's lows as risk comes back into the market. That's certainly been the case. Uh, we're going to go through the charts in a second. Any multinational company with revenues abroad will increase earnings materially at the, as the U.S. dollar weakens. Roughly 40% of the S&P revenues are, are generated outside the U.S. For example, Intel gets 82% of their revenues from outside the US, U.S. 3M gets 49% of their revenues from outside the U.S. PayPal gets 47% of their revenues from outside the U.S. Which, by the way, a lot of people have been asking about this Fed now. Uh, uh, payment system coming out in June and how that'll impact PayPal. Um, the answer is there's no way to know. However, the stock is already priced in a lot of the pain that could come uh, if it completely wipes it out. So let's just say they lost 100% of the U.S. revenues you know, with 50% being abroad, Fed now is not going to work abroad. So the stock is down, you know, 75% plus. So more than that, 80%. So I, yeah, stock's down about 80% from its 2021 high. I think this is priced in and at 50%, so you could, you could lose 100% of the U.S. revenues if all the fear is warranted and still have the business at a great price. I don't think it's going to, uh, from what I've read about it, it's more going to be used by credit unions that don't have Zelle. So I don't think PayPal and Venmo have lost a lot of business due to Zelle. Very few people use Zelle um, uh, relative to Venmo. So... Uh, so they're not going to lose 100% of the revenues. That's number one. Number two, uh, it's not just for direct payments. PayPal obviously has the huge processing business, which is their fastest growing. Number three, 
Um, as we said, half of their revenues are abroad. So, you know, these type of headlines are the things that create these these buying opportunities. And I think people get overworked up like the, the business is over, but they don't burden themselves with the facts that even if they're I always go to, OK, what's the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario is their U.S. revenues go to zero. Well, I still think the other 50 percent of their business is undervalued at these prices. So, you know, uh, uh, and by the way, the worst usually doesn't come to pass. Uh, in which case you have a monster upside on top of that margin of safety valuation. And that's how I do it. I do it with a crayon, not a scalpel. So um, VF Corp gets 45% of their revenues from outside the U.S. They're a big dividend payer uh, as well. MMM is a big dividend payer. Uh, VF Corp gets 45% uh, big dividend player. Stanley Black & Decker, 45% of their revenues abroad, also big dividend player. Baxter, same thing, dividend and 45% of their revenues abroad. So all these, as the dollar goes down and uh, treasuries start to get bid after they flood the market with a trillion dollars worth in the next few weeks, once treasuries get bid and the dollar goes down, all these things are going to work. Uh, and it's interesting that these are going to have a correlation, you know, 3M is going to have a correlation with Alibaba, which is mind boggling, but that's that's going to be how it plays. Um, long term treasuries will begin to get bid after a few weeks of heavy issuance following the debt deal. Uh, interest rate sensitive sectors will get bid. REITs have been left for dead as the long end of the curve gets bid and rates come down. You'll see this group begin to recover. Uh, banks will start to get bid again as their portfolio and loan book mark to market improves, reducing the need to raise capital. Funding costs will begin to moderate as deposit rates become more competitive to alternatives. Small caps will get bid as banks begin to recover. They have been a major, major laggard this year. So here's what's happened to the names referenced last week in the article I just read you in the last four trading sessions. So you had Cooper Standard had a 24%, 24.5% run in four trading sessions. Uh, Alibaba had a, actually an 11% run in four trading sessions. Uh, uh, Biotech, XBI ETF, 6.7% run. Emerging Markets ETF, 5.7% up. Vornado, up 22% in four trading sessions. Um, the REIT ETF, IYR, up 5%. This is all right after this article, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, IWM, the small cap ETF, up 8.9%. KRE, the banking ETF, regional banking ETF, up 16.39%. Uh, small cap, uh, 600, up 9.3%. Uh, Stanley Black & Decker, up 18.55%. This was a sea change, and this is going to follow through. Even 3M jumped 10% uh, on that news in a couple of sessions. Intel, uh, Baxter up 6%, and VF Corp up 17% in just four sessions. So we expect these trends to persist in coming months. The magic will be found under the surface moving forward as many new groups will dramatically outperform the Magnificent Seven and the indices in general. It's just the beginning. Now, Cooper Standard Update is now up over 100% since we disclosed it on our podcast video cast in May. And on the claim and countdown on June 7th, on Monday evening, city analyst Ite Michelli upgraded Ford stock to a buy from hold. The following rationale he laid out, if it comes to bear, will be tremendous for Cooper Standard as OEM volumes, original equipment manufacturer volumes, are the lifeblood to their profitability. He said, our latest survey revealed a surprisingly strong density outlook, wrote the analyst. Uh, which is code for people are buying cars more than we expected. Uh, not more than we expected, though, and we've been saying that. Uh, suggesting that recent auto demand resilience reflects a genuine increase in wallet share, McKelly cited, quote, more constructive view of U.S. auto demand post our survey and our above consensus estimated 2023 earnings per share for the Ford stock upgrade. Not only do Americans still like to drive, but they're also willing to spend more on their vehicles. This means light annual Annual light vehicle sales could hit 19 million in the U.S. in coming years, wrote McKelly. Annual sales had been bouncing between 14 million to 15 million during the depths of the pandemic. It's a solid outlook, partly, driven partly by the trend of people moving out of big cities. That's exciting. Alibaba update. On Sunday, I posted this table from Monish Prabhai. He's a, a long-term value investor. It illustrates the magic of buybacks over time and more importantly, the exponential effect they can have the more the company shrinks the float. And what's really amazing about this is, is the exponential growth. So in this table, he shows the magic of buybacks and he says if the company buys back 50% of their stock, 
uh, you're going to get a two bagger. If they buy back 67% of their stock, you get a three bagger. And what he says here is it only starts becoming magical after 80%. So after 80%, you get a 5x return. After 90%, you get a 10 bagger. After 95%, you get a 20 bagger. And 98%, you get a 50 bagger. And 99%, you get a 100 bagger. Um, now, what his assumptions are based on is the return without a change in earnings or PE multiple. So he's assuming zero multiple expansion, zero earnings growth. Obviously, what's questionable about this analysis is as they buy back stock, it becomes more expensive to buy back stock. But it's kind of immaterial because um, they continue to use the cash. And I equated this to Alibaba because, and I said how 10 baggers can happen. This is an exceptionally important table by Monish Pradhapai, hat tip to Q compounding. In the case of Alibaba Group, with over 60 billion of net cash and generating $25 billion of free cash flow per year, which is growing to 30 billion, CEO Daniel Zhang could buy in at least 90% of the company within five years or less. And, let's see what else I wrote here. So just, just picture that. So 90% means a 10 bagger. So, um, Okay, uh, this is, okay, so Zaniel Zhang could buy in at least 90% of the stock within five years and have a 10 bagger plus. This assumes no growth in any business line. This assumes that we continue to grow at pandemic lockdown levels in perpetuity, which is just completely unrealistic, but that's how the stock is priced at the moment, and that's gonna change. So uh, with, so again, if they buy in 90% of the stock, which they can do, and by the way, as they break into smaller and smaller pieces, you know, the political situation may not look favorably on one company be wor being worth a trillion dollars, but five companies each being worth, you know, on average 100 to 300 or 400 billion dollars would fly under the radar. And I think that's kind of the thinking in mind with this strategic restructuring. So with the company IPOing and spinning into multiple div divisions, there'll be greater latitude to extract value for shareholders, both from an economic and political standpoint, i.e. sometimes it pays to fly under the radar. We do not expect a 10 bagger out of Alibaba, but we do expect a multi bagger over the next few years. We've discussed our estimates of fair value repeatedly on past podcasts and video casts, as well as our sum of the parts overview here. So uh, biotech update. The deals and drugs keep coming. Uh, the, some, of, some of the parts, by the way, you could go through and we break down piece by piece what we think it's worth. Uh, adds up to roughly $300 a share, uh, 280 to 320 somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, and that uh, assumes basically no growth for all the business ex except for the cloud, which we do put strong growth assumptions on. And we think that they're very reasonable. And Daniel Zhang confirmed that, which we covered in the article last week. So uh, biotech update, This the deals and drugs keep coming. So you're seeing uh, more consolidation, more buying, uh, prices beginning to follow suit. The group is up 22% in the last six weeks. And you can see here the long-term view, you had the crash before the tightening cycle in 2015 to 16, just like you had last year ahead of the tightening cycle. And then you get these this rocky re rebound, it rallies up and then it, uh, checks back before making the final parabolic run, rallies up, checks back, and we're starting that final parabolic. So I I'm very optimistic on the biotech. That's a big position for us, uh, and it's starting to work very nicely. Uh, people starting to figure out what we've been saying since last year. Quote, uh, this is from the Josh Nathan Kazis article on Barron's. Many biotechs have net assets that top their market values. What does this mean? So he's talking about Atia Pharmaceuticals uh, being worth more dead than alive, which means if you bought all of Atia's shares and paid off all of its debt, the cash and other liquid assets remaining on its balance sheet would be worth more than what you spent. It's not alone. The collapse of biotech valuations since early 2021 has left a substantial number of biostecs in that position, which is known as having a negative enterprise value. 
And uh, as of Wednesday, there were 23 biotechs with negative enterprise values in the uh, S&P Biotech ETF XBI and the IBB. Many more were on the brink. Roughly 280 stocks in the two ETFs have nearly have 60 have enterprise values below 100 million. Rate hikes by the Federal Reserve since early 2022 have soured investors on risky long-term bets like biotech. Uh, one leading biotech analyst, Michael Yee of Jefferies, wrote that he expects biotech stock prices to start to rise in the second half of this year as investors anticipate interest rates dropping in 2024. We couldn't agree more, and that was our basis, uh, the basis of our thesis. So uh, now on to the shorter-term view for the general market. This week's AAII sentiment survey, bullish percent jumped to 44.5% from 29.1% the previous week. Bearish percent dropped to 23% from 36.8%. The retail investor is getting giddy with excitement. This can stay pinned for a while before they get taken out to the woodshed. I do think the pain trade is still up. We're just getting started. These can stay pinned for many, many months. Uh, CNN fear and greed indicator jumped from 61 last week to 76% this week. This is this is why I'm kind of like, if we got chop, it's not the end of the world. You could expect some. But I just think it's been in the doldrums for so long that, that this is going to get elevated and stay pinned for a long time and keep drawing the bears in and keep ripping their faces off with premium. So um, uh, sentiment is getting uh, okay uh, would not surprise me if it stays pinned for a bit to force people out of their bunkers and back into the market and finally the national association of active investment managers dropped to 53 percent this week from 65 percent equity exposure last week managers will have to play catch up or find a new vocation uh, moving right along earnings top 30 weights of the retail sector etf uh, cumulative earnings power of these 30 stocks was revised up by 2% in the past 60 days for, for this year and up by 35 basis points uh, for 2024. So while everyone has been calling nonstop since October for a 20% drop in earnings, uh, we've gotten the exact opposite. Earnings estimates have started to go up for many of the sectors. Transports, top 30 weights, revised up for 2023 by 69 basis points and next year down 1.23. Uh, we'll see. So this is transports. Um, this is probably on the basis of uh, air, air travel normalizing. Um, we'll see. But they're you know basically flat. They're not dropping the 20% that they had anticipated. Uh, here was that uh, CACs and PMI number came in at 57.1 uh, versus 55.2 estimated. And then today here was the, uh, the initial jobless claims came in at 261,000 versus 235 that should keep the fed in their box and keep this skip happening next week and uh until the inflation data makes the skip a pause uh this was a key number if this came in hot boy and you know it would have been harder and harder to make that case even though they've been preparing the market for it with this number here and the 3.7 percent unemployment uh and the uh, softer uh earnings growth i think they've got the clearing that they need to pause to skip and then turn it into a pause, which is really good news. Uh, as we said here, we saw this spike up in earnings in recent weeks, up in earnings in recent weeks. And now let's get to the ask me anything questions. Okay, so you've got, uh, Tom, what is your opinion on SoFi with the debt ceiling agreement that was passed that included the restarting of student load payments, Brady Todaro? Uh, I don't like SoFi. I think SoFi is basically a me too business that has been promoted by Jim Cramer because he's friends with Anthony Noto because Anthony Noto took um, the street.com public in 1999, probably when no one else would uh, take it public. And um, uh, I, I, I don't see any, any differentiating qualities. I mean, loan consolidation, you can basically do anywhere. Um, I think it's been a promote. They've got a nice stadium, but that's usually not a good sign. Uh, usually more likely a bad sign. Um, I would just say, uh, let's just take, I mean, let, I'll, I'll burden myself with the facts here, but, um, uh, negative return on equity, negative free cash flow, negative cash from operations, negative, negative, negative. This is just a promote. I, I'm going to say pass and I hope that I'm wrong and I hope they succeed in a major way. 
because uh, it's good for the country and it's good for everything else, but it's not for me. Uh, Sophia, Emma, and by the way, that's not to take anything away from Anthony Noto. I think the guy is a great guy. He served our country. He was a military uh, veteran and the whole thing. I just, I just don't see anything uh, extra special about the business itself. Uh, Sophia, Emma, uh, Thomas, you are awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for listening and sharing. You've mentioned previously that China is not ideal for long term based on the population issues and the uh, growth rate decline. Do you think Munger also shares a short term perspective and you taking a one to three year outlook simply because you're running a long short fund? In summary, it seems to me like buying Baba right now is effectively a diversified long position on China growth, something which could compound for many years to come. Um Uh, well, two things. I think it's a good question. I'm not in it because Munger's in it, never was, never will be. However, uh, I think we do differ. He probably would see this as a longer term play. Uh, I don't. I see emer For me, this is an emerging markets trade. And what I look for is the most leveraged margin of safety way to play it. And the most leveraged margin of safety trade, first you go to the country. I don't want Brazil for the emerging markets trade. I want China. Uh, I don't want, um, but if I'm taking the country risk, I don't want to take the company risk. So I take the best one. And then how do I distinguish from all the other e-commerce platforms that compete with Tmall? You got JD, you got Pinduoduo, you got a million of them. Um, uh, how do I differentiate? Well, I have the best cloud business and that's where all the growth is going to come from. So for me, this is a currency trade uh, wrapped up as a safety uh, margin of safety business enterprise. And I do think that their demography is going to catch up with them. That's the bad news. The good news is it's not for another three to five years plus, And that's my general time horizon on an investment because I have to deliver capital back to investors and they want to see a large enough return in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and I think this meets all of that criteria. So uh, the reason I wouldn't take it long term is emerging markets tends to be a currency trade. And I think that the conditions are set up for it to work both on the currency side, on the business side, on the deregulation side, on the emerging market flows side, on the dollar week side, uh, and the demographic side for the next three to five years. And then after that, I don't want to be involved. I want to start to look at India at with my China profits. I think it's early days for India. I know they've had a big run. Uh, but I think their infrastructure is going to develop. I think their population is going to age and I want to get them right. I want to get the Indian trade uh, in the future right where the China trade is now. This is the sweet spot from 33 to 38 to 40 during the family and housing formation. That's when all the spending happens. You go through history over the last 200 years. You can see all the booms around the world by country, by population. Uh, so it's going to be a huge run in, in uh, India, in China, and then that, those profits are going to be rolled into India, depending on conditions and opportunities there at the time. Uh, Vol Volislav Milu Milutinovic. Um, hi, Tom. Big fan of the pod. Was wondering if you could look at Boohoo. It's trading about five times normalized earnings. Well, two years ago, Wall Street couldn't get enough of it at 50 times. I can understand the macro concerns, but now it's trading below IPO price despite having grown the business substantially over the past decade. Thanks in advance. Keep up the good work. Uh, Boohoo, we have a small position in a competitor called ASOS. Uh, basically, we want to have some exposure to um, uh, UK besides Rolls-Royce, which it does the uh, airline um, uh, airline um, engine servicing. Uh, basically gets paid on the amount of hours that planes fly. And now that China's flying again, which hasn't even started, the China International really hasn't even started, which is going to be a huge growth driver. Uh, but we wanted another one because, you know, UK inflation is kind of like the worst in the developed world. The, the situation's the worst. So what's the most beaten down value in the UK? Uh, so we already have Rolls Royce, which is up a lot, um, and Asa. So Boohoo, I just think it's a B player, but let me just take a look. But it's basically the same trade. They also have Farfetch. But Farfetch, there wasn't really enough. They were too new for me to get interested. I like to see how businesses operate through cycles. And 
While I'm not thrilled with the ASOS CEO, he seems like a suit from McKinsey that's not really a great operator, it's too good of a business to screw up. And as the um, economy normalizes, they have such a large share in the UK, I think it's going to be a very levered play uh, to, um, to do good things. So um, yeah, it looks like you're getting a little recovery in Boohoo. Let's see. Yeah, same type of story. Um, where is that's cord? Here we go. B O O H O O. I think you basically have the same trade that I have, except mine has more history and a greater share, which gives me more confidence in making that leveraged of a bet. Um, but let's just take a look here. All right, so you're losing money the last two years. And cash from operations is okay. balance sheet I mean you know with these balance sheet looks okay yeah I mean I would have to understand the business qualitatively but on the surface it looks like it's worth exploring because uh, I put out an article a couple of weeks ago about UK being the best value trade uh, available right now I think it was Cliff Asnes was talking about it or someone, it was a Bloomberg article. You can look at it under the uh, daily reads that we put out. I think this is worth more of a look. I, I already have exposure, so I'm, I'm good. But um, I think what, understand the business. Go on the conference call, read a few years of annual reports. It's probably okay. It'll probably recover with them. It's been around a little longer than Farfetch. Um, maybe worth a punt, but you have to treat it like an options trade and size it accordingly. Because these aren't super high quality businesses. All right. Um, Javier, uh, check out Capri trading at 2012 levels and a peg ratio below one. Okay, so CPRI. This is, I think, the old Michael Kors, which should get some uh, legs in China. Okay, free cash flow positive. Um, CPRI. Hmm. It's interesting. It's interesting that. I think the business has grown a lot. Did I pull this up? It's carrier. Capri. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. The business is... Cash flow hasn't really grown a lot. But the business has grown a lot. And the stock's basically not, done nothing since inception. Since its IPO. Um... But it never did anything. It kind of never had a run. What what is about the quality of the business that people don't like it? Um, generates a lot of free cash. It has been a compounder. It's retained its margins. It's nothing not to like here. So what's the trade? Eight times earnings, give or take. Six 
sales are growing. All right, so it had Coors, consisting of Michael Coors, Jimmy Choo, and Versace. Michael Kors is 70%, Jimmy Choo is 11, Versace is 19. So you just have to understand the future of Michael Kors. Is that still popular? I don't know if that's popular in America, but it might be big time in China. And if that's the case, I think you got a winner here. Um, I don't see anything not to like. So um, I think... I think you, reasonable expectations, you could have a double in a, in a couple of years with this one. Uh, but you got to qualitatively understand the business because that's a lot of exposure to that one brand. And you got to see where is the demand coming from and why. But uh, generally good work, Javier. Uh, Bob Johnson, can you address the recent Canadian Fed hike coupled with the China economic data consistently showing a slower and slower recovery with the backdrop that historically U.S. inflation has never come down until the Fed's funds rate is higher than inflation. And right now, Fed's fund rate is 525, while inflation is roughly 5%. So not quite inversion, depending how you look at it. Can you help weave all these macro factors together and give us your thoughts? Well, number one, the macro is a waste of time. So buy a company that has a large enough margin of safety and is trading at a deep enough discount to its intrinsic value and forget all that noise. That's a waste of time. But since you asked the question, I'll answer the question. Um, you are correct. The Fed historically stops tightening when the Fed funds rate is above the rate of inflation. Now, this Fed's preferred rate of inflation is core PCE, which is running at 4.9%. The effect of Fed's run funds rate is 5.08%, which means they have met that target. And in fact, the inversion is now, which tells us why they're setting the stage and setting the table for a skip in June. And then if the data confirms it, the inflation data in coming months, uh, it will also be a skip in July, which means a permanent pause. Um, and we believe the inflation data is going to confirm it. So that answers that question. The Canadian Fed hike, uh, the Canadians, you know, I, I, I know I got a lot, a lot of lovely Canadians that listen in and they bought me that beautiful hockey jersey, but I got to say they're making a lot of mistakes lately and they're trying to choke us out with this, uh, smog in new york from their wildfires but uh no in seriousness i i hope everyone up there is doing okay uh but we don't appreciate the smoke just saying um uh yeah that was a surprise hike it kind of put the market a little bit on edge yesterday uh australia did the same thing and um you know but both of those are largely commodity driven um countries and i think that while it's a negative for them, it's a positive for us because it's going to start to create the interest rate differential that favors a weakening dollar globally. And Europe is still going to be doing some tightening. Some of these uh, other countries are going to still be doing some tightening while we're pausing. Uh, so they're going to be draining liquidity while we're basically starting to make liquidity environment more favorable and, um, and the dollar weaker, which all these countries globally need to do. Keep in mind, this is a coordinated effort. So they have to drain global liquidity, but they have to do so in a way that's pragmatic. And right now, the best thing that could happen to the global economy is that the dollar starts to weaken on a relative basis, both for emerging markets uh, and for the US. So I think we're gonna see more and more of that. And uh, while in the short term, it looks like a negative, I think it'll actually prove to be a positive. And keep in mind in terms of Australia and uh, Canada, as resource driven economies, you are going to see that resource demand really accelerate up. So, you know, I was looking at copper today, for instance, as China starts to crank in the second half, um, uh, you know, their economies are going to run strong uh, based on their commodity exposure. So that's probably a pro uh, proactive decision, probably unnecessary, but proactive on the basis of that second demand that I second half demand I see coming from uh, China and Asia. So uh, that should be that. And that's it, Bob. But again, stick to companies. Don't get tied into all that noise. All right, Raza R. Uh, I own Baba. I'm in total agreement with all you've been saying, but I went on their site for the first time the other day and it's pretty lame looking site for such a big entity. 
what's that about you think? What do you think about that is the question. Uh, well, uh, they have a lot of sites, number one. Um, so if you go to Alibaba. So first off, um, Raza, I would suggest that you lighten up your position because on the basis of this question, I can see that you haven't done a lot of your own research. Um, and you really need to do that to own a, uh, own a company. So, you know, this is opinion, not advice, as I always say. Um, you, you really have to understand what you're owning before you own it. And, you know, in the case of a lot of these Asian websites uh, look like this. Number one, so this is Alibaba's main site. It's perfectly fine. But then you've got Tmall. Which is another major site. Which is all in Chinese. You can't even get it converted to English. So I can't tell you if it's a good or bad site, but I can tell you the numbers based on how they're reported. Then you've got uh, Taobao. Okay. Uh, uh, well, all right, I'll get Taobao in a second. Ali Express. So that's Ali Express. They're international. That's growing like a weed. Uh, and this is what it is. I mean, it's just a ton of different products. It looks a little different than the U.S. sites, but uh, this is how they like it in Asia and globally, and it, it seems perfectly functional to me. I mean, you want products at a good price, and that's what they deliver. Uh, so you're looking just at the main site, but where they do all their business is the other sites that we went through. Here's Taobao. I think this one you can convert to English if I'm not mistaken. But they're all pretty much the same. I mean, it's just, that's what they are. They're e-commerce. You click on the category you want, and they offer you deals, and you buy them. And you make Tom Hayes and his investors tons of money over the next 24 months. That's the whole idea behind this site. So uh, so there we go. Then on TikTok, I got a few questions. Sassol, which is an energy company. Probably okay. I'm just not, I, I just don't think that a lot of these integrated have come down enough relative to energy for me to get super excited. When I can buy Alibaba, you know, at $130 billion net cash, there's no, there's nothing on offer for such a highly cyclical business uh, that's, you know, just if you have to buy, I mean, these guys aren't even generating a bunch of cash. What the hell are they doing? Nah, this is a garbage business. I'm going to pass on that one. It'll probably, the price will probably go up, but that's not the one I'd be in. I mean, we have uh, range resources from $4.10, and we have some com stock uh, from, I think it was five and change. I, I can't look it up now. Uh, but if we had to get more exposure to energy, those would be the two places we'd add, but we don't. So we're just happy with what we got, and we just ride the wave. Carrier was another one that uh, I was asked on TikTok. Um, okay, so he 
Yeah, they're doing that deal. I think a $10 million deal, billion dollar deal in Europe. Um, I did take a quick look at this one before. I, I've been wanting to buy it, but there hasn't been a great place to buy it. Um, it's a great business. It'll continue to grow. Margins have come in a little bit of late, but um, they, the CEO was on talking about these um, cooling systems. I think they're they're switching. It's some type of green cooling system that they're all going to have to use in Europe, and uh, they're kind of the key player. Um, see if they're generating cash. Yeah. What was this? Cash acquisition. So yeah, they're changing cash, free cash. I think long term it's okay. I would want. Um, uh, I'd want a bigger discount and I'm probably not going to get it. So I'm, I'm just not going to participate, but um, it's okay. But there are better risk rewards for my money. Um, they are buying in shares. That's good. I mean, it's okay. It's okay. I, I just, I think it's going to, I don't, I don't think I can make a double in a year or two. So I'm kind of, I might, but it's not clear to me. So I don't think you'll lose a lot of money owning it. I think it's okay. Got into Meta last year in the mid 150s. What do you think of Meta in the long run? Uh, I think Meta is good. I mean, um, I wouldn't buy it up now. Um, number one, good trade. I think I'm a hold. I wouldn't be initiating new positions here. You know, if you own it at 150, maybe it checks back to 200, scares you out of your stock, but just hold on to it. I think over time it's going to work its way back to new highs. Like I said, when it was going through that turmoil, never bet against Zuckerberg, and sure enough, he delivered. Um, all right, Eric from off of TikTok. How do you respond to the S&P 500 rally primarily being carried by seven large caps? The rest of the 493 companies are up 0%. Uh, we just covered that in the article of the week. That's broadening out, and that's the opportunity for the next six months. Um, Jason Patel, two questions. You've been at this for a couple of decades and extremely knowledge on the history of the markets. Where does the China Baba trades rank for you? In your mind, is it a generational opportunity to be buying China companies at these valuation levels, risk reward, or would you consider it on par with a lot of other big macro trades or dislocations? You've invested over your career. I can't objectively assess due to the lack of experience in the market. It seems to me like a trade investment op that lines up once in a decade or maybe longer generationals, maybe a stretch. Uh, I think this one's probably once in every five years. I mean, you know, if you look at it, it'll be like a three or four bagger. That's not huge. I mean, it. but the thing about it is it's not what makes Alibaba great. It's it's not that it could be a three bagger or four bagger over the next couple of years. What makes it great is that the margin of safety and the moat around the business is such that it afforded us the opportunity to put massive size into the position. So, you know, other businesses that can become 10 baggers, you would never put 20% of your capital into one idea. Uh, you just couldn't do it. it. It's not safe enough. You know, the risk is commensurate with the reward. You wind up with the 20, you know, with the 10 bagger outcome. But by definition, the, the risk of it being a zero had to exist. It was probably overestimated, but it had to exist at the time that the 10, bag, 10 bagger was served up. And our job was to do bankruptcy analysis and say, okay, it's not going bankrupt. If it doesn't go bankrupt, all the operating leverage, it could be a 10 bagger like Cooper Standard. But we couldn't lean as aggressively into that type of thing, which will wind up being a 10 bagger plus as we can into Alibaba, which will be wind up being a three bagger. So at the end of the day, the key is, is it generational from the standpoint of the amount of money you can make because you can size it up so much larger? In our view, yes. 
but in terms of the amount of multiples that we expect to cash out at, no, there are many other uh, opportunities that are bigger. You just can't size them as bigger because they don't have as clear enough of a moat or stability or share or runway. Uh, and that's how I would think about that. So in terms of total money, you can have a three bagger that you can size into that winds up making more than a 10 bagger that you can't size into at the end of the day is really what it comes down to. Um, how far do you expect the Dixie to weaken in coming years? 90 range and potentially stabilizes there, similar to where it traded in 2015 to 21 time, time frame, or given Powell's policy errors, will we be forced to eventually ease to such an extent that we may see the dollar drive back down to 2015, 2005 to 14 levels, 70 to 80 range? Could, could the current AI innovation foster enough growth to limit or slow the dollar from weakening as much uh, as maybe you pre, pre, uh, preciously previously anticipated i imagine a move just back to the 90s is quite significant for china companies let alone if dixie weakened to 70 or 80s trying to gauge how you're thinking about the length and depth of the dollar weakening cycle through the next few years in relation to the dollar traded over the last 20 years i think you're overestimating it the bottom line is the dollar just needed to stop going up so if it if it goes down and stays in the 90s for a little while i think that's enough to take alibaba where we need to do if it goes lower but I'll know more from the commercials positioning than I will from my guess of where price is going to be. I'll let I'll let the positioning tell me when the move is at or near the end versus my guess of whether it's going to bottom at 95 or 85 or 100. I mean, even if it stayed at if it got down to 98 or 95 and stayed there for a couple of years, that would be more than enough fuel to get done what we need to get done with Alibaba and get the hell out. But um uh i'll let the positioning dictate to me where the price move is going to end versus me dictating to the positioning where i think it should end uh that's that's um that's how i think about that but the key is the direction not the magnitude uh and and we're um doing just fine on that front so with that said i want to thank everyone for tuning in at, uh this week we'll be back next week same time same place in the meantime make it a great one and bye for now